multidimensional poverty measures in the sustainable development goals. Um, and then I'll move over to the unidimensional poverty class. Can I ask how many of you are aware of the SDGs? Ah, very good. And how many of you are actively working on SDG indicators? Okay, so that's something where there really is a quorum. So you can correct me um, if I misinterpret anything. So I ended the previous uh, lecture with this slide, which is in a sense why look at multidimensional poverty in the SDGs. Um, and here in this session, I'm just going to briefly bring you up to date um, on this ongoing process of identifying indicators for the Sustainable Development Goals and show you which countries are already reporting MPIs, which institutions are starting to come into the ground of building MPIs, and where we might go from here. So I think that we know um, that very happily um, at the UN General Assembly last year, with a great deal of fanfare, an address by the Pope, um, by Malala, youth from 193 countries, songs, uh, an inspirational um, talk and photos from the air uh, space station to planet Earth. Um, the sustainable development goals were agreed by all of the heads of states of 193 countries. And what was agreed in particular were 17 goals and 169 targets. And an inter and agency an expert working group was set up to identify the indicators that would be used to measure those. And as has already been mentioned, the goal of reducing poverty has a strong prominence in the SDGs that was not always certain. Because as you know, there was a Rio process, there was an intergovernmental process which came together with um, a UN process um, last, la in, the, in the past two years. But the second sentence of the preamble of the final document, Transforming Our World, puts the priority, the, the number one priority, on um, eradicating poverty and reducing poverty in all its forms and dimensions. And poverty is the number one goal uh, of its reduction, is the number one goal, goal in the SDGs. Now, let's step back. I already mentioned that the term poverty in all its forms and dimensions is mentioned a number of times in the final document, but where did that come from? So you may remember that there was an open working group um, that met a number of times in the United Nations um, and then came up with a document proposing actually the same 17 indicators and 169 targets. And the Open Working Group document included multidimensional poverty in uh, target 1.2. Um, and that came about politically, um, really due to the activism of Mexico with Peru, and Colombia, and Guatemala, um, bringing this to the fore uh, towards the end of those uh, Open Working Group sessions. Um, and the final wording which was put forward in the Open Working Group document is by 2030 to reduce at least by half, so reduction in the percentage, the proportion of men, women, and children of all ages living in poverty in all its dimensions according to national definitions. That's a very long and complex phrase. It's an internally inconsistent phrase in some sense because reducing by half um, would seem that we are talking about a comparable measure, the same definition of poverty, whereas national definitions means that every country could have its own definition of poverty. So it's been, in a sense, the ambiguous wording of goal 1.2, which has meant that it has been one of the more difficult targets to um, agree on an indicator set for. The other background, there were a number of background um, moments before July 2014. For example, um, the first draft of the SDGs only included income poverty. And then there was a big backlash by NGOs that organized themselves to 
in a sense, re renounce that and call for multidimensional poverty to be given more priority as a, as a lead indicator and not just monetary poverty. So that was one of the, the focuses um, which came forward. Um, and there were also a lot of discussions at that time about whether the $1.25 a day goal was too low. Um, and so whether it was appropriate in, it, in and of itself, even as a monetary measure. In December 2014, I don't know if you remember that, but the debates about the SDGs had been somewhat controversial. There had been different processes. Um, it had been the most extensive participatory and consultative process, perhaps in history, very, very ex ex expensive. Um, slides I couldn't show this morning were of the 9.7 million people who voted on the My World survey as of last night when I went online to check it. Um, and in addition, the UN organized 88 thematic and eight regional consultations on what should be in the SDGs. There's a tremendous process behind it. But when you involve people, they become opinionated. And then nothing that you agree suits everybody. And so after the July Open Working Group, there was a sense of disappointment in many actors that there were so many goals and that they seemed so unwieldy and ambitious. So the UN Secretary General's report in December of 2014 wanted to lay out a couple things. It wanted to point out that we want to be ambitious. We're at a time in history we have to be ambitious for the poor and for our planet. But he also wanted to give, in a sense, messages of hope without touching those 17 goals, um, he laid into place some framing, a, a nice conceptual framework for understanding them. But the document, very importantly, also gave greater prominence to multidimensional poverty. So for example, um, and I've put some quotes on the slides, um, section 2.1 observed that some of the gaps left by the MDGs were these multidimensional aspects of poverty because income poverty MDG target had been met, but many of the others, the multidimensional aspects of poverty, had not been met. So the SG Secretary General wanted to focus on those. Also, he wanted to focus monetary resources on these aspects. So in discussing financing for our future, multidimensional poverty was named. Um, because, in a sense, concessional loans shouldn't only depend on the low-income status of a country, but also on the burden of multidimensionally poor people and the fiscal demands that that will place on the government. And then, in terms of me measurement in particular, um, in terms of looking at the new dynamics of poverty, there is a specific um, recommendation, not only that the, the metrics or the measures should be very focused on these wider concepts of well-being and poverty that are not just monetary, but in particular that poverty measures should reflect the multidimensional nature of poverty. This language is sometimes forgotten in the later documents, um, but it's, it was a very important moment in the di discussion which was occurring around the SDGs and their indicators. Um, following on the Secretary General's report, also in December, uh, 2014, the United Nations uh, 69th S Assembly um, re made a, a re resolution, and part of the resolution again reasserted the need for multidimensional measures. Um, so they underlined that sentence from the UNSG's report. They underlined the need to better reflect the multidimensional nature of development and poverty, um, and and. That includes developing better me measurements for it, um, and for poverty and, and for human development. So we are sitting in a time in history when, in a sense, these measures that we are about to study are being demanded um, by different uh, groups internationally. And then, um, as we already know in the final document, Target 1.2 was maintained with the same language as the open working group had been proposed. Um, I, as I already mentioned that the second sentence of the preamble, which is printed there, um, recognizes that eradicating poverty in all its forms and dimensions is the greatest global challenge 
and an indispensable requirement for sustainable development. And it's important that extreme poverty, which is the $1.25 or $1.90 a day, is mentioned as one aspect, including extreme poverty. But the implication is that the overall focus is wider. Also relevant, as I mentioned earlier, is that the nature, the multidimensional nature of poverty requires an integrated and multi-sectoral um, policy response. And the preamble also has highlighted that. There is recently, they just had their first meeting, uh, an interagency expert group on interlinkages between SDGs. And clearly multidimensional poverty will be part of those discussions. So that is the framework that we have inherited in the SDGs. And from that, how do we move to the indicators? So the conversation on indicators started well below before February 2015. Um, but I, I'm starting there randomly so that this doesn't go on too long. Um, there was a preliminary list of indicators um, that was uh, put forward. Um, in February 2015, and it included the MPI disaggregated by sex and age group, and that MPI was to be computed by the World Bank and UNDP. It also proposed the national poverty line. It did not clarify if the MPI was um, national or global, that is if it was comparable or not, but the surveys that they mentioned are, include the surveys that are used to compute the global MPI. Um, the next step after that was in Addis Ababa, whether there was a high level meeting on financing for development. And that meeting was in a sense shaping where resources would go, including for the measurement of the SDGs. And they called upon the UN to have transparent measures of progress and explicitly requesting that those recognize the multidimensional nature of poverty. Um, and so this is the statement from the final revised draft from that meeting. Um, and then there were many, many discussions in different regions about what the SDG indicators should be. And I'm sure many of you took part in them. I'll just name a couple. One was in Africa, um, the SAHASA, the Strategy for Harmonization of Statistics in Africa, um, includes most of the heads of national statistics offices in African countries, as well as these other institutions. And in May 2015, they adopted a set of indicators that included the MPI um, as an indicator for 1.2. And they mentioned that this was important because, in their understanding, the MPI embraced SDGs 1 to 8 and 10. And it enabled there to be a headline that encapsulated these different sustainable development indicators and gave them prominence because they became a headline in parallel with the $1.90 a day measure. Also, Jeff Sachs and the Sustainable Development Solutions Network were tasked with considering indicators and proposing them to the UN Secretary General for the Sustainable Development Goals. And they have a number of reports, including ones after May 2015, I should mention. And in all of their reports, they have commended the use of a global MPI to measure 1.2. Um, uh, because they feel that having a, a comparable measure and trying to reduce it by half uh, is perhaps a little bit more effective than trying to reduce by half national measures which have widely disparate definitions of poverty. They suggested therefore using the global MPI but dropping the indicator of flooring, so just using nine of the ten current indicators. Now, these different voices and suggestions came uh, towards an authoritative body, and that's the Interagency Expert Working Group, which has 28 member governments that um, are drawn from the different regions and are meant to represent the, their, the voices of their region, not just themselves. Um, and 
they have met a number of times since June 2015. Um, and the secretariat, the coordinating group for them is the UN Statistics Division. And in June 2015, um, the UN Statistics Division proposed um, a list of indicators, but there was widespread concern by the governments that this had not come from them and that they very much wanted ownership of the final SDG indicators and time to reflect on them. And so the first meeting of the interagency expert group really focused on process and not substance um, and how their deliberations would go forward and how countries could shape the process. And that was because there was a reaction against the Millennium Development Goal indicators, which countries had felt were imposed on them from the outside. And they didn't feel ownership, they didn't feel that they had the dignity of shaping the own objectives to, against which their progress would be reported. Um, also, um, in the list proposed by UN Statistics Division, Target 1.2 was now only reflected by a national income poverty line. Multidimensional poverty had been dropped and the countries um, objected to that. We were actually at that time in Cartagena with the network and there were fast and furious phone calls between members in Cartagena and members attending the meeting there. After the June meeting, the interagency expert group solicited comments and obtained over 1,200 pages of them. Um, and just to give you a little bit focused on our own topics, um, Africa proposed that the MPI be a target in 1.1, that it'll be both uh, in, in, instead of necessarily the $1. twenty-five a day measure, which um, was a little bit controversial. Other countries, including Denmark, Turkey, Mexico, Colombia, and the World Bank, um, reproposed the MPI for target 1.2. And it was also proposed um, as a priority or tier one indicator by a number of countries. So there is lots of discussion. And what you're seeing is that these countries that are named are also uh, members of the interagency expert group. Those are among the 28 countries. China is one of the 28 countries as well. There was the first this meeting after June was in Bangkok um, and there, there was discussion of all of the indicators. I must say the discussion of MPI lasted perhaps longer than any other. It was 90 minutes in length. Um, in a sense because it's a new indicator Many are not familiar with it. There were many questions. Um, but there was also a, a unanimity, particularly in the African and Asian countries and much of Latin America, that this was a priority. But there was some resistance from um, a minority that ended up seeming to be effective. Um, uh, so there was a lot of conversation after Bangkok in making the paperwork uh, reflect what uh, participants had understood to be decided in the meetings. At the UN Statistics Commission in March of this year, uh, 231 indicators were released. Now there are 239, but eight of them are repeated. So it's 231 in total. Um, and they were notionally not accepted outright. There was more of a resistance than was accepted, expected to them but they were agreed as a working document that would be finalized over time. And at the end of March in Mexico was the third meeting of the interagency expert group. And at that meeting, um, the discussion turned in a sense to which indicators um, had enough methodological details to go ahead and compute and which needed further work. And there were um, uh, also discussions at that third meeting on the MPI those discussions were held in the closed conclave of the 28 member states and their results will be um, published before September. But I understand that MPI may again be named explicitly as an indicator of 1.2.2. What had happened in the meantime is that the indicator of 1.2.2, which was multidimensional, simply was referred to by the same language as the overall target which meant that people didn't understand what it actually was measuring. Um, 
In July, just last a couple weeks ago, um, the Secretary General released the first SDG report. Um, but they only, in this report, used um, very clear indicators. And for all of the par poverty, all of the goal one, they only used $1.90 a day, youth employment, and social protection features. This is not because that is what will be reported in the future, but this is what they already had agreed in a very clear way uh, as tier one indicators. However, in the, at the same time that the UN and the, the formal system is trying to clarify matters, countries are going ahead and taking action. So for example, among the MPPN countries, we threw out an email to say which of them this year are reporting an MPI for target 1 point, indicator 1.2.2. And the following countries said that they were reporting either a national, a global, or both MPIs in their SDG portfolio. And it's these countries, I think, that will be the leaders um, in a lot of the discussions to come, these and, and other countries that are reporting but maybe didn't answer the email that particular week. I would be remiss if I didn't um, mention at this time um, that we are at a pivotal moment in terms of the World Bank's measurement of global poverty. So um, the World Bank, as you know, updated the measure of poverty from the $1.25 a day to the $1.90 a day. And at the same time, they took into account the 2011 PPPs, purchasing power parity exchange rates. Um, that was a, quite a difficult and a controversial, um, uh, well, it was anticipated to be controversial in the early papers following the launch of the PPP data. Um, and because of the difficulties in updating the $1.90 a day when there is a change in the PPPs, Koshik Basu, the chief economist, <coughs> commissioned a group led by Sir Tony Atkinson, who um, created the Atkinson measure of inequality and is a stellar leader, both in social indicators, poverty measurement, and inequality measurement, um, to give the bank advice on, first of all, how to update the $1.90 measure a day in the future, what to do with PPPs, um, how to update it at least until 2030 when the SDGs expire. And second, what other indicators the World Bank should really take ownership of and report and track as their own. So the Commission also sought input from civil society. There was an initial draft report discussed on the 13th of July. Um, the final report will be published in September, although I'm going to take the liberty of quoting from a draft report in the next session. And among the questions which the Atkinson Commission considered was whether multidimensional poverty should be measured by a dashboard or by an MPI, and which dimensions of poverty, non-monetary dimensions of poverty, should be attracted officially by the World Bank. Um, so that um, commission is offering the bank a possibility that the bank will compute an MPI um, that may include some of the dimensions already considered, may include violence. Um, that would have implications for survey data um, that underlie it. Um, but it certainly opened a space for discussion which had not previously been opened. And I think it's been a lot of this movement and the voices from many sides which has created an environment in which there really is a sea change um, in, in the space for multidimensional poverty measures. Um, so I'll just conclude by pointing out some standing questions. The first and the most important is what is to be cut by half? I'll give the example of Mexico and Bhutan. According to Mexico's national poverty measure, about 46% of people are poor. According to the global MPI for Mexico, about 2.8% of people are poor. So the question is, which of these two numbers should be cut by half? So you might say, well, it's completely up to the Mexican government 
But then a question is the financing for development and the priorities. For example, consider Bhutan. According to the global MPI for Bhutan, 28% of people in Bhutan are multidimensionally poor. Um, so if we use Mexico's national measure, then Mexico has a greater number of people, so its poverty reduction should have a higher priority than Bhutan. But if we use the global MPI, which can be compared, Bhutan has 10 times higher proportion of MPI poor people than Mexico. And so there's a real question in the SDGs about whether we are aiming to cut national or global comparable measures of poverty. In either case, there is also a question of what indicators should go into an MPI um, for the SDGs, for countries that do not have them, and also for the global MPI. Should it not have flooring, as Jeff Sachs suggested? Should include violence, as others have suggested? Should it try to include work and labor? And that entails changes in the surveys. Which leads to a, a fourth question. We are in a time of data revolution in terms of household surveys. I didn't mention it this morning. I only mentioned the past data revolution. But again, now the World Bank has promised to have poverty surveys every three years. What will be in them? What multidimensional indicators will be contained? This will affect what we can measure in the future. And finally, at the moment, the global MPI is estimated by OFI and by um, a very small group of basically one or two people at UNDP. Um, if this becomes a, a prominent indicator, then which institution will undertake the burden of measuring and analyzing it each year? So these are some standing questions. So that's just a quick briefing as to where we are. Friends who know more than I and are more politically adept than I think that we should celebrate that multidimensionality is in the SDGs, that MPI will probably be named the next time a list of indicators comes out, and that the real question is whether uh, the reduction by half applies to national or global measures. Um, there is also a question of what MPIs apply to Europe and OECD countries, but because the dollar ninety a day is hardly used or applied to them, it's not at the moment on our top priority list. Um, so that's what I wanted to present on the SDGs. Can I ask, before I start, how many of you have constructed monetary poverty measures for your countries from start to finish? Fantastic. So you've done the consumption or income aggregate, you've set the poverty line, you've done the robustness tests. Yeah? Good. So please feel free to contribute your experience. I'm very glad we have this experience in the room. Um, this session is really to review um, unidimensional poverty measures and also to look at some of the new trends in the empirical side, um, particularly some of the calls to, for example, report total error, which has not been done in the past. And to remind ourselves also of some of the conundrums that face income poverty, so we don't feel so badly when we realize multidimensional poverty also has conundrums. But uh, we see both of them as really important and constructive exercises um, that face into some challenges. So for this, um, we are using pr primarily section 2.1 of the book. Um, but there's also a book that's full text online by James Foster, uh, Michael Lokshin, Schumann Schett, and Sajaya. Um, which focuses not on the empirical side, but on the um, functional forms of poverty, inequality, and welfare measures, but primarily poverty. And that's published by the World Bank in conjunction with their ADEPT software, which is a freeware you can use to implement poverty measures. Um, so those are the two main references. So, Draw a breath, shift gears. I'm just going to put some notation on the table so that we are all on the same page. When we're talking about a reference population here, we're going to talk about a society. And that could be a country, it could be a region. But we are talking about a population, all of the people in that society. When I speak about a unit of measurement at the moment of identification, I'm going to speak about a person 
but we all know that many income consumption surveys uh, use the household as the unit of identification. And we are going to talk about N persons in society. So N is just the number of persons. Then when we measure poverty, we have to select a space. Will it be income? Will it be consumption? Will it be something else? And um, to indicate that space, we're going to use D variables. And now in income poverty and consumption poverty, these are the parts of your income aggregate, the elements of your consumption list. Okay, so how many variables do you have? And th there'll be a lot of these. And xij is going to reflect the performance of a person i in dimension j, or in indicator j. Um, and obviously there are n people and d dimensions. And we can think of an achievement matrix as summarizing the achievements of all persons in all kinds of income, in all elements of the consumption list. So it's a matrix, but it will be much larger than the matrix we will later use for multidimensional poverty. I'll mention at the end of it, it might have 500 items, whereas multidimensional poverty might have 7 to 20. <clears throat> so each row will be the achievement vector of the person, their consumption or their income components. Um, and the overall achievement of a person is XI, and that's their aggregate. It's the resource variable, it's the welfare indicator, it's the income or consumption aggregate, and that's what we set a poverty line across, is that um, total or overall achievement, total consumption, um, total income variable. So when it's income, you basically add up all of the sources of income, when it's commodities, you multiply the commodities consumed by their prices and sum them to get the total consumption expenditure. So when we, for example, talk about an achievement vector with people having income of 9, 4, 15, and 8, then those 9, 4, 15, and 8 are their consumption aggregates or their income aggregates. Um, it, and the vector represents all of the incomes in that society. So you can have a vector of all of the income or of all of the consumption of the society. And it might be ordered if you are working on dominance, which I don't think we'll have time to get into much, but it might be ordered from um, lowest to highest. Um, and if so, we often display the information on the distribution using a cumulative distribution function um, denoted by f of x, um, which will take different values um, for different people uh, and their income vectors. These are ordered for a CDF. So um, the first person um, has 4, and then 8, 9, and 15. So you can see one person has four, one person has eight, one person has nine, one person has 15. This is hopefully a review. <laughs> yeah? Yes? Yeah, okay. And obviously when we have a large population, the CDF will usually be this S-shaped curve um, with, um, against which we can set different poverty lines. So what the cumulative distribution function tells us, and this is what's important for poverty, is the share of the population that has an income less than a given poverty line. So f of x of 4 is the share of the population, the proportion, the headcount ratio, having an income less than 4. Right? So that's why we always consider CDFs as we're thinking about uh, uh, fixing different income poverty lines, and particularly if we're doing any kind of dominance um, comparisons of societies to different poverty lines, we're going to use the CDF. Now, one slide that's particularly important. Um, I know that you are all quantitative experts, but there's one very basic aspect of measurement 
that I find sometimes hasn't been taught accurately. And it's so basic that I'm a little bit embarrassed that you will think I'm patronizing you, but please forgive me. Um, James Foster always emphasizes this, that when we talk about measurement that's relevant for policy, we often measure three different things, and it's very important not to confuse them. Um, one is the size, the mean, the welfare of a population. And that's going to be some function of the entire distribution of that society, like the mean income per capita. That's a very good welfare index, or the median income per capita. But then we might want to know that mean could go with very different levels of inequality. So we might want to know something about what we're going to call the spread, the inequality of society. That is the range, the tops and the bottoms, and, and where the distribution is among them. And inequality measures, which are ratios of income standards, um, reflect the spread. And then we, when we come to poverty, we are looking at the base. We are putting on blinders and just looking at this part of the population and ignoring the non-poor if we use an absolute poverty measure. If we use relative poverty measure, it's a little bit different. So here we're going to focus on poverty. But I do this because, for example, we are often asked, how does the Human Development Index differ from the MPI? Well, the Human Development Index is a measure. Which of these three measures is it? Size, spread, or base? Size. HDI is a welfare, a well-being measure. It's the size, it's the average income, average life expectancy, average schooling, mean years of schooling. So it's the average, and it's a mean of means using a general mean in its current form. Um, so it's important to keep these in mind um, as, as we go ahead. And the MPI, the income poverty measures, they are going to be measures of the base which censor the distribution. So in the first section now, I'd like to take a few minutes to think a little bit about how we make that step that I showed very quickly on the screen of creating the income or consumption expenditure aggregate. This is a step that if we read books like Foster, Loksh, and Seth, which focus on the measurement of poverty, we simply start with these aggregates. We never ask questions. We simply think about the functional forms we can apply to them. But because we are doing empirical measurement, we have to really understand how we get from household surveys to these aggregates. Um, and these are key to unidimensional measures. We won't be talking about them after today. So I'm going to just throw out there quite quickly uh, a few observations. And um, some of these come from discussions about how poverty measurement, monetary poverty measurement, is changing at the present um, in terms of national poverty measures. One is that there is a long-standing discussion of whether to use income or consumption. And this is a regional discussion. In Latin America, it's income by tradition. In China, it's income by tradition. In most other parts of the world, it's consumption. Um, the World Bank monitoring report I mentioned earlier today um, articulated a preference for consumption as an indicator of welfare. That preference was also indicated by Tony Atkinson in 1997. Um, analysis of household surveys in the Gluey Grosch book of the World Bank, again on um, the creation of, of consumption poverty measures. Um, at, but in a sense, there's always going to be a question of which is used and why, and some analysis of what differences are available. So, for example, um, Martin Revalian uh, and Chen. Um, found 27 countries that had both income and expenditure from the same survey. They applied poverty measures. They found that income tends to give higher poverty rates, but the differences in those 27 countries were not statistically significant. 
There's another study of a larger set of countries that did find more differences. But it's important to recognize, first of all, that income and consumption are not going to give you the same analysis, either in terms of level or disaggregation. Um, but what I'm going to focus on is really the measurement of consumption, <clears throat> because I think for many countries um, that is what's used. And here, just want to make a number of points that I think are obvious, but just so that we remember them. First of all, consumption is not the same as measured expenditure. Um, so uh, you, you have to, to go a little bit deeper. And one of the features of consumption surveys is that they, how the survey is designed and the particular wording of questions, the particular items on the consumption list, the particular sampling frame, do affect the results. There's something that Chris could tell you much more about, um, a, this debate in India about the difference between having a seven versus a 30-day recall period in the consumption um, survey, uh, the national sample survey, that it actually makes a big difference on the level of poverty, whether people report just the last seven days where they are more accurate because they can remember what they ate or the last 30 days. So the length of recording period matters. It matters whether they do a diary, whether they retrospectively try to recall what they consumed, These, how the questions are asked, how the data is uh, obtained, um, actually shapes uh, what you get. And so you can't compare a diary-based consumption ex survey with a recall-based consumption survey. Obviously, um, consumption is seasonal. In some periods, you consume a lot, um, and in others, it might be lean. And so trying to understand the seasonality of, of consumption surveys, if they are implemented over a, a year with the same waves going in the same regions as um, some governments do, then that tries to uh, make sure that the national averages um, are immune to seasonal effects. Um, but when we go down on the individual level, seasonality may still affect it. And then there are lots of studies on what, are, what is the ideal length. Um, I was in India recently and the chief statistician there said that their current consumption expenditure survey has 520 items, but he wished it had 1,000. You know, that more would be so much more accurate. And then there were a number of studies of shortened consumption questionnaires because they take a long time, an hour and a half to two, two and a half hours. But the shortened consumption questions that grouped questions together weren't necessarily more accurate or as accurate or even reflecting the same patterns. So how the actual item list is, is divided makes a huge difference. And then there are others, particularly imputation of rent for owner-occupied housing is always a difficult one always how you impute rent will affect your results. Always robustness tests are required for those. Um, and uh, issues of transfer or collective consumption of healthcare education, when those are monetized and brought into the consumption aggregate, um, they, they will have some kind of an effect, um, clearly on the poverty numbers, um, depending on the assumptions that are used about how those services are enjoyed. So I, I hope this is a review, but just so that we remember that as we put this aggregate together, we're working with data that in a sense are quite complex um, to work with. And for that reason, I think one of the new um, ideas which is gaining ground and which I believe the Atkinson Report may also highlight is the need for national poverty measures um, as well as any World Bank poverty measures to report t total survey error. Um, <clears throat> at the moment, for example, global $1.90 a day does not report um, standard errors, even sampling errors. Most national poverty measures report sampling errors because you can get them um, from your sample weights and from, from the design. But the observation, particularly for monetary poverty, and this may be a bigger concern for monetary poverty than multidimensional poverty, is that the magnitude of non-sampling measurement error may be much greater than the magnitude of sampling error. So one obvious thing is you ask somebody how much they earn, 
and they don't want to tell you. <laughs> it's embarrassing, they don't know what you'll think of them, or they don't remember, or whatever. They want it to be lower, they want it to be higher, um, higher so that they look good, lower so they get some benefit, right? So um, there may be inaccuracies simply in obtaining the data. You may enter it into your tablet or your paper incorrectly. Um, there may be, um, when you impute, when you model, when you extrapolate, there are many sources of errors that can come in. So here's a list um, of non-sampling errors, which in a total error approach, you should have a section of your national poverty, monetary poverty report, which discusses these. Often you may not be able to actually put numbers on all of them, but to discuss them to consider how they affect the results. For example, if you have multiple periods of time, would they all bias results upwards? And do you have some reason for thinking the bias would be equal in magnitude? Or actually do not know? Um, and, and, and sometimes we don't know. But I think that this going beyond um, simply sampling error to look at the, the probably the larger sources of error is becoming best practice. And then there are a number of other issues which uh, remain not necessarily controversial but done quite differently in different country contexts. Whether or not intra-household inequality is measured at all. Um, whether women's work, the care burden, um, the differential um, access to resources by household members, whether it's the name in which land ownership is held, who owns different assets, who has decision-making power over them. That, um, often is not included. How equivalent scales are done, whether it's per capita, whether it's a square of the household size, whether children ha are one a fraction of an adult and what the age cutoffs are for age equivalent, age specific equivalent scales. Those are done very differently by different countries and they do make a difference. Um, so it's just to name those and recognize those. At a macro level, there's a well-known mismatch between uh, household survey data and national accounts. When we think of income per capita, multiply it by the population, it doesn't necessarily give us the same number. And this matters particularly for poverty because we often use extrapolations from national accounts data to predict um, future poverty. But the rate of growth of the economy may not be the same as the rate of growth of total consumption expenditure, particularly for the poor and near poor. And so the relationship between national accounts and household survey data really matters, particularly when we are moving into extrapolation because we don't have enough household surveys. And then there are issues of consumer price index, how that's formed, um, how that's compared across different regions of the country. Um, there are issues of domestic inflation, rural urban price comparisons, rural urban poverty lines. So there are a lot of moving parts <clears throat> in making the consumption aggregate. And I simply wanted us to remember them, to m recognize that the nature of any poverty measurement um, requires a lot of understanding of the data. And this will also be the case, but in very, very different ways, and hopefully in simpler ways as we move to multidimensional poverty measures. Um, and I close this section uh, by simply observing that the presumption, very often, as we move from monetary to non-monetary poverty, is that the data requirements of non-monetary, of multidimensional poverty, are higher. Because in monetary poverty, you have one dimension. And in MPI, you have, you know, five, ten, three dimensions. Not ten, sorry. <laughs> three or five. Um, but actually, empirically, this is really quite important for you, particularly if you're going back and trying to convince people to invest in surveys. The, the cost in terms of survey data and time of collection is much lighter for multidimensional poverty surveys. So, for example, Cambodia's 1993 survey had 450 consumption items. It's not unusual for consumption surveys to have a lot of lists. When we turn to national MPIs, the national MPI with the most questions to date is Costa Rica, which has 20, as I mentioned this morning. 
And that is based on 77 survey questions. The global MPI on 39, Colombia on 38. So the number of survey questions and the, the cost, in a sense, of those, therefore, of the data collection is lighter. And I think that's important for all of us to know um, because when you are presenting in public, your audience will presume that instead of 500, you need 5,000 questions. So it's quite useful to uh, take away their fear that the data costs of multidimensional poverty will be much higher. So just in terms of this particular section on building the aggregate, the welfare aggregate, my suggestion is that we really scrutinize how the survey data are treated in order to become this consumption aggregate and understand the decisions that may affect poverty, like imputation of rents, and do robustness on them, as is best practice already. But going beyond that to, in a sense, the cutting edge, to now start to itemize the sources of a total error and discuss them and bring, bring, um, bring people's awareness to them, not in a negative way, but in a constructive way to try to improve. Um, for example, improving the missing populations, the homeless, the institutionalized in hospitals, orphanages. Um, they are excluded from all of our surveys. They are defined out of poverty. So bringing, bringing to bear, bringing to mind these issues helps the community focused on data collection to think of ways of gathering data on these missing populations. And finally, um, just as in we, we will study later how we do it with multidimensional poverty, to really always assess the robustness of measures to different definitions of the consumer price index, different ways of computing domestic inflation, rural prices, urban prices, and the like. Um, these are already done in many academic studies, but they're not necessarily done outside. They're not so hard to do, but it's, it's good practice. Okay. I mentioned earlier Amartya Sen's 1976 paper, um, an ordinal approach to measurement of poverty. And in that paper, he said that the measurement of poverty requires the identification of a space in which poverty should be measured. And then it has two steps. One is identifying who is poor. And the second is aggregating information on poor people into a society-wide measure. So identification as to who is poor um, means that we are going to, for everybody in this room, say you are poor or you are not. And we will have a definitive, unless we use a fuzzy set, we'll have a definitive set of poor people. We'll know their names, we'll know their um, entry numbers in the data set, and others who are non-poor. So um, it's basically identifying poverty status. And usually we use a poverty line to do that when we're talking about unidimensional poverty. Um, we'll call it Z or Z. And so the person is poor if their income, let's say, is strictly below Z. Sometimes it's weak, but we'll say it's strictly below Z. And non-poor if their income is equal to or greater than Z. Um, and Xi is the ith element, it's the ith person uh, of this society-wide vector. And the poverty line is used to identify who is poor based on their aggregate, their income aggregate, which we now presume is perfect. Okay, we've just thrown out all of our worries. We presume it's perfect. If their aggregate is less than the poverty line, they're poor. Equal or greater, they're more. So we identify. And then it's also a benchmark, it's a goal to policymakers to bring people's income at least to Z. Um, and if we are using an absolute poverty line, which is what I'm going to discuss today, we ignore the non-poor people. We simply want to bring people to or above the poverty line. So I mentioned that a poverty measure looks at the base. And so what we do in effect in income poverty measure is we censor or we erase the incomes above the poverty line. Um, so we create a distribution, a censor distribution, which I'll call X star, which if the person is poor, we give them their actual income. But if the person is non-poor, we give them the level of the poverty line. 
And that means we're blind to whether they're Bill Gates or whether they're at the poverty line itself. Um, we're, we're treating them all the same because for the moment we're just focused on the poor people. <clears throat> so for example, if the poverty line is 10 and those are our incomes, then people 9, 4 and 8 have their own incomes because they're poor. But the person who's 15, we give them 10. We censor at 10. And if you want to look at that graphically <clears throat> on the con CDF, um, we censor at the poverty line and basically erase that part of the curve that's above the poverty line. And we give everybody just the poverty line values. So if a poverty measure reflects the focus axiom, that's the distribution it's based on. If it uses a relative poverty measure, doesn't reflect focus, then it's something else. <clears throat> Once we have identified the poor, then we question how can we create a poverty measure? And that is the aggregation step, and it answers the question of how poor is the society. And what we're going to try to do is summarize somehow all of that information on poor people into a scalar, into a number. Um, and so, just in terms of notation, the poverty of distribution X given poverty line Z is what we're going to be looking for. So now we're going to pause and say, well, what are we looking for? You know, what kinds of poverty measures might we want? What, are there, what, the, what is the behavior we sh would expect? And so we're going to return to what I touched on before lunch, which is properties of measures. And as I mentioned with the Gini example, sometimes measures that don't behave in the way that we expect them to um, will not provide accurate guidance for policy. So we need to check explicitly which properties a measure fulfills. So I'm just going to give one example and then give a number of others. So first of all, we're going to start with the most common poverty measure, which is the headcount ratio or the proportion of people who are poor. So in this classroom, let's say 10% of us are poor. That's the headcount ratio. So what is wrong with the headcount ratio? Right. So um, that's pr precisely right. So we have a society with four people, and their incomes are seven, three, four, and eight, and their poverty line is five. So two of them are poor. So the headcount ratio is two over four, or fifty percent. You're with me. And then person three loses a dollar of income, and so it's seven, three, three, eight. They get poorer. Does the headcount ratio change? No. So it's blind to how far people are below the poverty line. But clearly, for person three, that's worse. <laughs> they're still poor, but they're poorer than they were before. So we might want a poverty measure that reflects that, that reflects decrements or um, decreases in income below the poverty. And that was the motivation for the poverty gap. And the poverty gap measure, P1, in the Foster Gear Thorbeck class, looks at the, num the normalized gap from the poverty line. So it's 5 minus 3 is 2 divided by 5. So person who has 3 is 40% below the poverty line. And 5 minus 4 divided by 5 is 1 over 5. They're 20% below the poverty line. And so by looking at how far people are below the poverty line, we add information. So if then person four loses for per, a, a units to become, to only have three units, then poverty will change. So according to the foster gear thorbeck measure, the poverty gap is the mean of that vector, zero, two-fifths, one-fifth, zero. So it's three-twentieths, but poverty goes up to four-twentieths if that person loses a deprivation because then they're 40% below the poverty line instead of 20. Are you with me? Yeah? 
Okay. So the name of that property is monotonicity. So if you want a measure that does that, you need a measure that reflects monotonicity. The head count ratio doesn't. So that's an example of a property. And of course, that is not only important in an academic sense, but it's important for policy. So I am a corrupt policymaker. I want to reduce poverty to get reelected, and I want to reduce it by the most possible. So what I do is I find the people who are 20 cents below the poverty line, and I bring them up to the poverty line, right? That's my incentive. And then I get a big change in the headcount ratio, right? So they're reaching out to the person closest to the poverty line, and the poorest of the poor, they'll never get looked at because they're too hard, they're too expensive, and I don't get rewarded as a policymaker for bringing somebody who's, you know, $3 under the poverty line to $2 under the poverty line because the headcount ratio doesn't change. So if you want to give policymakers an incentive to go to poorer groups, then it has to reflect monotonicity. So that's one example of a property, why you might want it in terms of your intuition, why you might want it for policy. Is that clear? Okay, so I'm gonna go, so please use a measure with monotonicity <laughs> or a stronger property of transfer, which I'm not gonna go into. So I'm just gonna briefly go through some very basic properties that I mentioned in the slides last time so that you see what they are. And these are things that I think we all assume are gonna happen, but what I need you to know is that not all poverty measures make them happen. And that's why we have to really get into the details. So let's say that there are four people and they switch their incomes. So it's Anna, Bob, Jack, and Jane, and they have that vector, 5445, and then Anna and Jack switch incomes. No, somebody, yeah. And so it's 4455. Should poverty be the same or different? It shouldn't matter whose name is poor. It should just matter their achievements, right? So that's the property called symmetry. Not all measures reflect it. But if the measure is symmetric, that is, if it doesn't matter whose name is poor, if it just matters the vector of achievements, then it reflects symmetry. And in particular, if there can be a permutation of income, that is, one poor person swaps with a non-poor person, and poverty is the same, then it reflects symmetry. This is easy, right? Okay, so how about this one? You have a society with four people, three people, and then a society with nine people. Which of them has more poverty? So the poverty line is 10. So in the first society, two people are poor. And in the second society, three people are poor. So um, I think this would have been better if these were all nines. Yeah. Yeah. This is a better one. Look, look down here. So basically, if you have the same vector, but if you've duplicated it, um, then poverty should be the same. So replication for population size. So think of a generalized Lorenz curve versus a Lorenz curve. You want this to be the same regardless of population size, right? Otherwise, we have problems. So replication invariance guarantees that. And how about if we switch currencies? If we switch between dollars and pounds, or yuan and rupees, should that affect poverty? No. So that's called scale invariance. And again, not every measure reflects it. In some, if you multiply it to change it to another currency, poverty changes. So these are why the basic properties that we assume will occur um, are important to check. Um, and then, this is a, a trickier one, this is a newer one. So we have a poverty line of 10, three people equally poor in two distributions, but the non-poor person has different levels of achievement. 
How is poverty different? No change. Okay, so we are blind to achievements above the poverty line. When that occurs, we reflect the axiom focus. When we move to multidimensional space, there are two axioms, poverty focus and deprivation focus. But it means we're simply focusing on the poor people. And then here's one, just like what we saw. So we have a society in which everybody's poor in both vectors, but in one, a person is slightly less poor. There's been an increment in their um, achievements, which has less poverty. Second one, right. So that's what we already saw, which is monotonicity. That's what the headcount ratio couldn't distinguish from of, because by the headcount ratio, it's 100% poverty in both. Yeah? Okay. I'm almost done, don't worry. Um, how about this one? So everybody's poor, and the overall achievement is 20 in both vectors. 1 plus 9 plus 1 plus 9, 4 plus 6 plus 4 plus 6 is 20. But in 1, there's some people with very low achievements, and in others it's smooth. So there's more equality among the poor or inequality among the poor. Which has more poverty and why? X. Why? Yeah, because some people are deeply poor. So that's the property I didn't mention earlier which is the transfer. And that is if there is more inequality among the poor, then poverty is higher. And if we think of the foster Greer thorbeck um, class of measures and the squared gap, the squared gap reflects transfer. The poverty gap doesn't, right? Because the poverty gap would be the same. It's one-tenth and nine-tenths, two of each, or six-tenths and four-tenths. The poverty gap is exactly the same for those two distributions. But if you square the gap, raise it to an exponent greater than one, then it reflects transfer. Hmm? Severity, yeah. Good, you guys are great. <laughs> um, and there is, of course, a limit to the amount of transfer um, that you can do. I'm going to skip this. Oh, no, not this one. I'll keep this one. So now here's another one. We have a society of four people, which is made up of a society of two people and a society of two people. Which distribution has more poverty? Um, so x2 and y2 are the same, 15 and 8, and y1 is 6 and 4, whereas x1 is 9 and 4. Which distribution, the total distribution, has more poverty? So the poverty line is 10. Does society X or society Y have more poverty? Why? Why? <laughs> Y has more because Y2 and X2 are the same and Y1 is poorer. 6 is below 9 by monotonicity, right? So, but what we're presuming is actually that um, it reflects subgroup consistency. And this is an essential property for subgroup decomposability which means that if the population size of each group and the poverty line is unchanged, um, then the poverty of the larger group, which in includes an equal portion and a changing portion, will be the same. And related to that, um, we can see many reasons why we would want sub con subgroup consistency in policy purposes. Um, primarily, you know, if, as I already said, if poverty in re one region has reduced very fast, then poverty overall should have reduced if nothing else changed. 
um, and it is related to monotonicity, um, but it's looking at the aggregate level instead of at the individual level. Now, it's one step from that to the final full property of decomposability, which is defined in this way. If the poverty of the total population is equal to the poverty of the first population multiplied by the percentage of people in that country who live in the first population, plus the poverty of the second multiplied by its percentage of people. If it's that simple, an additive decomposability, then um, it's subgroup decomposable. So we'll go into this as later next week when you do the decompositions. We'll go into this when you do the AF exercise. You'll implement this um, by tomorrow afternoon, in fact. Um, but this is a, a very important um, property for both unidimensional and multidimensional poverty measures. And finally, I'm not going to go through these in depth, but there are some basic properties that we assume. For example, we often assume that poverty measures go from 0 to 1. The head count ratio, 0 to 100 percent. And so we normalize so that it, it is in that range. It's not essential, but it's, it's often done. Now, we also may or may not require continuity. Um, the head count is a discontinuous measure. Um, there, there, are, there are many that are discontinuous. But the, the property of continuity, when it's satisfied, means that there's no sudden change in the poverty measure, um, given the underlying distribution. Whereas a head count ratio will have these jerky moments. Um, but many poverty measures, including the AF, uh, do not respect continuity. And then the, the next class of properties are invariance properties. And what these basically say is that a measure shouldn't change. It should be the same if certain things happen to it. Um, sorry. So th these are the, uh, we've done the invariance properties already. We did them at the beginning, the replication, the scale invariance, and so on. So these are the classes of measures that I've gone through. I've gone through them for unidimensional measures. The slides that I showed you but didn't go through in detail have them according to the same categories for multidimensional poverty measures. This is all we're going to cover because I notice that people on this course are not terribly enthusiastic about um, axiomatic techniques. But I hope that this has given you a bit of intuition as to why they can be important. And what we've done is we've done the homework so that you don't have to of making very explicit the properties that the measures that we teach respect so that you can know what you're working with, know how it will reliably affect policy, and know the policy incentives that it provides. So anyway, um, I'll talk a little bit about um, the poverty measures. So although we've already criticized the headcount ratio for not reflecting monotonicity, not reflecting transfer, Sen criticized it for this in 1976 when he developed the, what is known as the Sen Index of Poverty. So between 1976 and 2016 is a number of years, and yet what does the World Bank report? The headcount ratio. What does your newspaper report? The headcount ratio. So we'll see why, in our session on communication, the headcount ratio remains the signal measure of poverty, despite its defects. And the real reason is that policymakers can understand it. Policymakers who will not attend this course. Citizens who don't want some complicated number they can't understand. So the need to have ways of communicating poverty metrics outside academia is very strong. And it means that flawed measures make it where perfect measures um, may fail because they are too complicated to understand, too complicated to act on. So um, it's going to be a common theme of this course, the need to communicate MPI very clearly um, to uh, non-experts. So the headcount ratio reflects the proportion or the percentage or the share of the population who are poor. It ranges between 0 and 1. 
And basically, if Q is the number of people and N is the population, if you have a whole society, it's Q over N. If you're using a survey, it's Q times its sampling weights over N. So I think we saw this already in a society of four people. Three of them are poor, and the headcount ratio is 75%. It's that simple. Okay, so as soon as you've fixed the poverty line, you can very easily pull out the headcount ratio. It also satisfies a lot of principles. So just so you know, it does satisfy symmetry. Your name doesn't matter. It does satisfy replication invariance. The size of the society doesn't matter. Scale invariance, the currency of income doesn't matter. Focus, it ignores. If you use an absolute poverty line, it ignores the achievements of the non-poor. Normalization, it goes from zero to one. Subgroup consistency, subgroup decomposability. You can break the headcount ratio down by whatever regions, by whatever groups the survey are representative of. And changes in the regions or groups will affect national poverty in a predictable way. So it's actually a very good measure in terms of its properties. It does not satisfy monotonicity, transfer, continuity, as I mentioned already. And there are reasons why we, we might want these to direct policy me members' eyes to the poorest of the poor. As the SDGs put it, to leave no one behind. We have to know who are the poorest of the poor and care about them. But as we've already seen, it just takes, picks off the least poor, gives the policymaker the incentive to pick them off, um, and not the severely poor. So the next measure in the class, um, which predated FGT, but is the P1 measure in their class, is the poverty gap ratio. And what it does is it addresses monotonicity, as we saw, by looking at the normalized shortfall from the poverty line. Um, which is the poverty line minus the sensor distribution over the poverty line. Remember in this, every non-poor person is given the value Z. And so for every non-poor person, their normalized gap is zero. zero. Perfect. The mean of the vector of normalized gaps is the poverty gap measure. What's quite important for the MPI, in terms of the notation we'll look at tomorrow, is that you can equivalently write the poverty gap ratio as H times I. H is the proportion of people who are income poor, and I is the average normalized gap among the poor. Have you heard of that? So H times I is the poverty gap measure, what we'll see is something very parallel tomorrow for the MPI. The MPI is basically the poverty gap measure in multidimensional space. You can also write it in a different way. I won't go over that. Um, but you can look at the poverty gap ratio. Um, so it also satisfies monotonicity and continuity, which the headcount ratio did not. It doesn't satisfy transfer because if you reduce the gap by one unit, it doesn't matter if the one unit goes to the poorest person or a person in the middle or a person near the poverty line. Um, it's, it's basically blind to who, whose poverty is reduced by that amount. So it doesn't provide extra incentives to reduce. It, it provides incentives because you get credit. Poverty goes down if you reduce the poverty of the poorest person. But you don't get extra credit if you reduce their poverty as a priority over somebody who's of moderate poverty status. So the squared poverty gap, or the FGT measure, called P2 in their notation, takes that normalized gap, two-fifths, for example, one-fifth below the poverty line, and squares it, raises it to an exponent that's strictly greater than one. And when you do that, so we already saw the gap, and now it's the gap squared. When you take the mean of all of the gaps squared, and remember non-poor people's gap is zero, um, and so the squared gap is zero, 
when you take the mean of all of those, it's the poverty squared gap measure. And I don't know if you want to go through the example, but you can see that 10 minus 9 over 10 is 0.1. 10 minus 4 is 6 divided by 10 is 0.6. So the second line shows you the gap. And then the third line shows you the squared gap, 0 0.01, 0 0.360. And the mean of that is 36, 37, 41, 41 over 4, or 0.102. So that's the arithmetic. It's that simple. All of the FGD class are that simple. Um, and we'll come back to this notation tomorrow in a multidimensional way. Um, but now you are experts in the FGD class, and this satisfies transfer in addition to all of the other axioms that the poverty gap and headcount ratio satisfy. In that sense, it gives policymakers extra credit if instead of taking a moderately poor person and lifting them one place, they take a deeply poor person. So to go back to this example, if you have the poverty gap and you raise the person who's 0.6 to 0.5 or the person who's 0.2 to 0.1, the poverty gap goes down by 0.1 and it doesn't matter. It'll be the same change in the poverty gap regardless. But if you look at the squared gap, if you raise the person from 0.6 to 0.5, the squared gap goes from 0.36 to 0.25. So it changes by 0.11. If you go from 0.2 to 0.1, it's 0.04 to 0.01. It changes by 3. So it changes by 3 rather than 11. So you have much more punch in terms of your change in poverty measures if you go for the poorest of the poor by the FTT2 measure. Do you all see that? So that was the discourse in those days about why they wanted to make better measures that really gave policymakers credit, given that we know how difficult it is to address the conditions of the destitute. We want to give policymakers extra credit when they succeed in doing that. So this is the class of measures. Each of them start with the censor distribution. And they take the gap, which is the poverty line, minus the censored achievement, where every non-poor person just gets the poverty line, divided by the poverty line. So every non-poor person's gap is zero, and everybody else's gap is their percentage shortfall from the poverty line. It raises that gap to alpha, which is some coefficient that takes different values. And then it simply takes the population mean of the sum of the gaps. So if the gaps are raised to zero, it's just one if you're poor at all, no matter how poor you are, and zero if you're not. That's the headcount ratio. The mean of the vector is the headcount ratio. If it's the poverty gap, then it's the mean of the gaps or of the squared gaps. Alpha can obviously take other values with other um, implications. So that's the FGT measure. Just because we're coming to time, I won't go through now. I'll just take three minutes to fly through slides but not present them. What I've done is just explained how to identify people as poor, and that entails selecting a poverty line. And then how to measure poverty in a society, which means selecting a poverty measure, the squared gap, the gap, the headcount ratio, the Watts, the Clark, Hemming, and Ulf. You know, there are many different poverty measures that you could select. And that raises a problem um, in that the selection is a little bit arbitrary. It might be what you know. It might be the do files you have. It might be the convention in your country. But you want to know, well, what difference does it make? Would my conclusions change for policy if I used a different approach? And of course, they might. And we have some examples of where the gap and the measures um, change with different um, functional forms. Where we end this presentation is by saying a very useful set of tools that we will go over in depth for multidimensional poverty is to look at robustness or dominance over a limited range. So um, in the case of poverty measures and unidimensional poverty, 
um, we've standardly looked at distributions, CDFs, and tried to see if they first order dominate, second order, third order dominate each other. And therefore, if we could say that for all poverty lines and for all possible functional forms of a poverty measure, poverty in society A would be higher than in society B. And if we can find that kind of dominance, then we rest secure that all of our arbitrary choices don't matter. For any poverty line, it would be the case. Um, this is the work of Jean-Yves Duclos, who is Bouba's supervisor, um, and it's a very interesting act. <clears throat> and so I won't go through this, um, but um, you will have the slides, and if you're interested, you can ask Bouba. <laughs> Um, but what we're going to look at is two distributions with their standard errors if they're coming from household survey data. And we're going to see if we have this beautifully perfect first order stochastic dominance where we do get a, a dominance effect. So we know that for any poverty line at any level, poverty in one society, FY, will be greater than in FZ, FX. <coughs> um, but often, of course, we don't get that beautiful picture, um, and so curves cross. And so we al also often explore a limited range. We think, well, what are the possible poverty lines that would make sense in my society? What are the functional forms people really consider? And then in that limited range, we study dominance. And sometimes we can get better results in a limited range. And we'll show you that tomorrow for the global MPI uh, across cutoffs from 20% to 40%, for example. So that's the close of this session, um, a marathon on unidimensional poverty. So first of all, um, I tried to clarify a little bit more some of the basic properties of measurement just in unidimensional space, because it's, if you get the intuition there, you have it in multidimensional space, and listed the properties, for example, that the FGT uh, measures satisfy so that you know them um, and went through a little bit about why you need to know those for policy and some incentives and we'll do a little bit more of that with the MPI as we go on um, and also in the closing session suggested that we make explicit the choice of poverty line of identification method of aggregation method and we do robustness tests dominance analysis, different ways of subjecting our results to a bit of a stress test to make transparent how sensitive or rigorous our measures are to small changes in functional form in poverty line. As Professor Li Shi said, maybe it seems to be a big change, but maybe when we look at trends over time, it's not a big change. Maybe they all give the same answers. So it's this empirical exploration of the data that I keep coming back to whether in the first session on why a multidimensional measure or on this. Really trying to scrutinize the data, play with it, understand it, and so that when you make a final result, you know precisely the value added of your research.